Lance Herring was an American citizen born in Saudi Arabia to his parents, who were both teachers working overseas. When he was five years old, amidst the outbreak of the Gulf War, he would move with his family to the United States. But they would later return to Saudi Arabia a few years later when he was just seven, and Lance would later credit his childhood there for giving him an appreciation of other cultures. He would end up spending his formative years there in the Middle East, but would eventually move with his family to Golden, Colorado, where he would come of age at the turn of the millennium. Fresh out of high school, Lance decided to follow in his father's footsteps and pursue military service, with his father having been an army infantryman during the Vietnam War. Now faced with his generation's own version of Vietnam, Lance decided to enlist in the U.S. Marine Corps, and despite scoring a 99 on his aptitude test, decided to join the infantry. Later speaking to the Denver Post, he explained, quote, I didn't want to join the Marines to sit at a desk. But, life in the Marine Corps would turn out to be much less glamorous than Lance Herring expected, with him quickly beginning to realize that things inside of the military were just as pointless to him as the things outside of it. He did not know it at the time, but a seven-month tour in Iraq would result in him suffering from a severe case of PTSD, with him being unable to explain his issues to anyone and growing increasingly disillusioned with the world he was living in. Five months into his tour, in fact, he had experienced a breakdown, which was later described as an acute mental disorder, which resulted in him being sent to a military hospital in Germany for testing, but he was ultimately sent back to Iraq afterward to finish up his tour. Later, Lance would receive 30 days leave and be allowed to return home to Colorado, but as he prepared to do so, an idea began to form. On August 30th, 2006, Lance Herring decided to just disappear. He managed to convince a friend from high school to pretend that Lance had been injured and left behind during a rock climbing trip, which would encourage a large-scale and unsuccessful search of the mountainous area. All the while, Lance boarded a Greyhound bus headed east to Iowa, and then later to the Pacific Northwest, living in the Seattle area for a time under a pseudonym. Investigators were quickly able to get to the bottom of the hoax concocted by Lance and his childhood friend, charging them with filing a false report and forcing them to repay the cost of the search and rescue efforts. But Lance would carry on the ruse for about two years, during which time he remained off of the grid, even among his friends and family back home. But in 2008, he would reach out to his parents for the first time, letting them know that he was okay, having lived as a vagabond for the better part of two years. His father would fly out to visit him in Seattle, and it was only then that Lance was finally taken in by authorities, having gone AWOL from his military service in 2006. Thankfully, the military treated Lance with leniency, fining him a little over $1,000 and sentencing him to time already served, because of the various mental and emotional issues he had been enduring at the time of his disappearing act. This would give him an other than honorable discharge, which, contrary to popular belief, is different from a dishonorable discharge. However, he was later sentenced to 18 months probation in the state of Colorado for filing a false police report, and was also ordered to pay back thousands of dollars for the state's extensive search and rescue operations, due to the hoax he had thought up with his childhood friend. This story seemed to have a happy ending, with Lance Herring being able to settle into a quiet life after his legal hurdles were overcome. But his decision to run away from home, from his military service, might have had more far-reaching implications than originally thought, with law enforcement having to spend time and effort to look for the missing Marine, time and effort that might have been better spent elsewhere. It has also been theorized that his disappearance, which came just months before the disappearance of another military member in the area, might have had an adverse effect on her case. Some have speculated that Lance Herring's hoax, which began to unravel shortly before the disappearance of this woman from Texas, might have caused investigators to overcompensate in certain regards, believing that she might have gone missing under similar circumstances, unwittingly overlooking potential clues or leads that might have led to her being found. This is the story of Nani Dotson. Nani Ann Dotson was born on June 29th, 1973, as the female half of a pair of twins. Her twin brother was named Bo, and she had an older brother named Tony, both of whom she would remain very close with throughout her life. 
Nani grew up in the region of Colorado Springs with her mother, Candace, who had become a template for stability that Nani herself aspired to. Candace was a member of the U.S. Air Force who would raise all of the kids on her own. Her husband, Nani's father, committed suicide when the twins were just a year old, leaving Candace to raise the children together as a hardworking single mother. The family would remain in Colorado Springs for the foreseeable future, with Candace and the children living in the shadow of the Air Force Academy. Academy. In the early 1990s, Nani would graduate from Overland High School in Aurora, Colorado, just outside of Denver. In the years to come, she would end up marrying and divorcing one of her first loves, and would end up getting involved in a future career path, nursing. Eventually, Nani would end up following in her mother's footsteps, commissioning into the U.S. Air Force. Working as a nurse, Nani would be stationed at Lackland Air Force Base, a rather mundane-looking place just outside of San Antonio, Texas. There, as a first lieutenant, she was assigned to the 59th Medical Wing in May of 2004, where she would work as an intensive care nurse at Wilford Hall Medical Center. Outside of her military career, Nani was a huge fan of country and western music, and had been visiting those kinds of bars and dance clubs in both Colorado and Texas. While living in San Antonio, however, she decided to take country dancing lessons at a local dance club, and there, she met a man who would become an important figure in her life. A man that was 20 years her senior named Edward Veal. The two would date for a short period of time, during which time, Nani became pregnant. Ed Veal, the child's father, chose not to carry on with his relationship with Nani, having strongly opposed this pregnancy. According to many of Nani's friends and family members, he strongly encouraged her to get an abortion and wanted nothing to do with their child. For that reason, his relationship with Nani came to an early end, and his relationship with her and their child would remain rocky over the next couple of years. Regardless, Nani had decided to keep the child early on, choosing to raise them as a single parent, despite the insistence of her mother Candace, who had experienced the hardships of being a single mother in the military and knew how tough it would be. Years later, Candace would recall to reporters with the Denver Post, I knew exactly what she was going to be up against. It caused some conflicts between us. She was very naive when it came to being a mother. She said, Mom, this baby is not going to change my life. I'm going to live my life and enjoy it. Nani would give birth to her one and only child, a daughter named Savannah, in 2005. Despite raising Savannah as a single mother, Nani was hoping to go on a military tour of Iraq, having started training in critical air transport, which, in very basic layman's terms, equates to helicopter ambulances in active war zones. It's an extremely dangerous job. However, with her military service ending in March of 2007, it seems like Nani began to abandon this dream in lieu of being there for her daughter, and was planning to move back to her home state of Colorado after being discharged. In November of 2006, the week before Thanksgiving, Nani decided to visit with her friends and family in Colorado. She and Savannah, who was about 16 months old at the time, would fly back home and stay with her older brother Tony and his family in a suburb of Denver. And in addition to visiting with old friends from the area, Nani would hire a real estate agent to help her begin looking for a home in the Denver region. It seems like she was beginning to seriously contemplate a life outside of the military, scheduled to be discharged from the Air Force in just a few short months but would never get the chance. The week before Thanksgiving 2006, November 13th to 20th, Nani Dotson would end up staying with her brother Tony and his family. Tony was married with two children at the time, and lived at a home along the 9500 block of West Unser Avenue in Littleton, Colorado, just northwest of Chatfield State Park. On the evening of November 18th, Nani went out with some friends to a local bar, staying out until the very early morning hours of November 19th. Later that morning, she would wake up and use the computer for a bit, and then would ask her brother Tony and his wife Amy if they would be okay watching her daughter Savannah again. Later that day, she was planning to go out shopping with her friends and hoped to spend a few hours with them, maybe even going out for a dinner and drinks afterward. Tony, Nani's older brother, would later mention that he had some errands to run that day, but he wanted Nani to be able to enjoy her last afternoon with her friends, before having to fly back the following day. Later, speaking to reporters, he stated, I thought it would be nice for her to get out and get away and do whatever. I only needed to get some trash bags. I knew she was trying to hook up with some friends, but she hadn't yet.
At around 2 p.m., Tony was downstairs in the basement of his house, playing video games with one of his kids, when Nani called out from upstairs that she was leaving. According to Tony, he did not believe that she was heading out to go shopping with her friends quite yet, but had mentioned wanting to go grab a smoothie at a juice bar not too far away from Tony's house about a mile away in a nearby shopping center. But after several hours passed without Nani returning, Tony and his wife just assumed that she had met up with her friends and would be returning later that night. They would end up watching Savannah throughout the evening, ultimately putting her to bed in the bedroom that she and Nani had been sharing while visiting. The following morning, Monday, November 20th, Tony and Amy woke up to Savannah crying. When they entered the bedroom, they discovered that Nani had not come home the night prior. They had expected her to have gone out dancing with friends at a local country bar. They would look around for Nani that morning and would file a missing persons report that afternoon when it became clear that she was not returning to pick up her daughter in time to make the return flight to San Antonio. As they would later come to learn, Nani had seemingly vanished right into thin air. When Nani Dotson was reported missing to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office on November 20th, she had already been missing for approximately 24 hours. She had last been seen the afternoon prior, at around 2 p.m. on November 19th, when she had left her brother Tony's house wearing black pants, a white t-shirt, a gray hooded jacket, and carrying her black purse, which contained her wallet and cell phone. But other than that, all of her belongings remained behind at Tony's home, as well as her young daughter, Savannah. Tony Dotson would later tell reporters, She asked me to look after Savannah for a couple hours, and she walked out that door and we never saw her again. She would never have intentionally left Savannah behind like that. Nani did not have a vehicle of her own in Colorado. Having just flown in to visit with friends and family, it was believed that she had either left Tony's house on foot or had been picked up by someone in their car. Because she had told her brother that she was heading out to grab a smoothie at a nearby shopping center, the Jefferson Village Shopping Mall, which was a little over a mile away from his home, it was believed that she might have just walked there. But friends of Nani's would later state that she wasn't the type to volunteer to walk long distances if she could help it. So this led investigators to believe that she might have gotten a ride with somebody. That somebody, however, would remain a mystery. None of her friends that lived in the area recalled seeing her that day. Tony would tell investigators that the night before her disappearance, November 18th, Nani had gone out to a local country bar called Grizzly Rose, where she had been line dancing with some of her old friends from high school. There, she had reportedly started dancing with a man, who Tony recalled had helped her avoid a pair of other men that had been obnoxiously flirting with her. He knew this because the day after Nani's disappearance, the man had reportedly called and asked if he could take Nani out for breakfast. This was the first time that Tony heard anything about the two men apparently harassing her at the nightclub, which she had not spoken about. That Saturday, Saturday. Nani had used Tony's car to drive herself to and from the country bar. She returned home after 2 o'clock on Sunday morning, having apparently closed out the bar with her friends, and had not mentioned anything about a man or men she had encountered at it. Tony would tell reporters that he feared maybe one of these men, the pair that had been harassing her at the Grizzly Rose, might have followed her back to his house. Police would attempt to identify these men, but would find nothing that pointed towards any criminal involvement. By all indications, Nani had disappeared into thin air, having walked out of Tony's home on the afternoon of November 19th and promptly going missing. She was scheduled to return to work on November 21st, but would fail to show up for her scheduled shift, making her, in essence, AWOL. Records would indicate that her return plane ticket, scheduled to take her back to San Antonio aboard a Frontier Airlines flight that week, was never used. In an effort to determine where Nani Dotson was, investigators would begin to look through all facets of her life, both personal and professional. They would learn about a woman that was well-liked by her colleagues, who was a hard-working single mother that enjoyed country music, who did not do any drugs, easily proven by the constant screenings required by the military, and only drank socially when she went out to the various country and western bars she frequented in Colorado and Texas. They would also learn that Nani had been heartbroken after her breakup with Edward Veal, the father of her daughter, and had held off on dating anyone until just recently. Investigators would learn that Nani had been active on dating websites, including one website in particular called 
singleparentsmeet.com. She had logged onto that website at least twice prior to her disappearance, once at around 2.30 a.m. on the morning of November 19th, the date of her disappearance, and then again about 11 hours later at 1 p.m. The latter was roughly one hour prior to when she left her brother Tony's home, and would indicate to some that she might have arranged to meet up with someone that afternoon, but more on that later. Authorities would attempt to track Nani's movement through her cell phone activity, learning that she had last made a call at around 11 a.m. on the date of her disappearance. Police have never revealed who this call was made to, but that her cell phone would show signs of movement afterward. The date after Nani's disappearance, November 20th, 2006, her cell phone would ping in the area of southwest Littleton, near Ken Carroll Ranch, about 20 miles southwest of Denver. This was incredibly close to Tony's home, not too far away from the highway C-470, and was within proximity of the shopping center that Nani was last known to be headed to. Police would bring out canine units to search the area, using some of Nani's clothing left behind at Tony's home, and were able to pick up her scent throughout the area. However, they would ultimately be unable to find any trace of Nani nor her cell phone, both of which remained missing. Jefferson County Sheriff spokesman Jim Shires would claim that authorities had pinpointed the last signal from Nani's cell phone to a roughly 30-foot area in a 3-4 to four acre field nearby the Jefferson Village Shopping Center. It was reported that her cell phone battery had stayed on for approximately 90 hours before dying or being turned off. Jim Shires would later tell Nancy Grace during a broadcast of hers on November 24th, 2006. We've tried three or four times to, as they say, triangulate where that cell phone was, and we came up to the same location each time we did that. That field, the area where that phone was supposedly located at, and had not moved for three days until, we believe, the battery went dead, has been walked by our canine units, many of our employees here, investigators here, and sheriff's deputies. Unfortunately, the lack of any strong evidence in this case, or a crime scene for that matter, would prove to stymie the ongoing police investigation. Unable to find anything pointing to foul play, investigators were unable to determine whether or not Nani had been kidnapped or had gone missing of her own accord. Jackie Kelly, a spokeswoman for Jefferson County, would tell reporters about a week after Nani's disappearance. There seems to be two camps, that either she had some involvement in her own disappearance, or that potentially something tragic had happened to her. We have no information to support that one theory is more credible, or more likely, than the other. We simply have nothing new. Zero. Faced with an overwhelming lack of any evidence, investigators in Colorado would begin to reach out to authorities in Texas, formally requesting their help into the case, which they believed might stretch across state lines. After all, Nani was visiting Colorado, but she lived in San Antonio. Authorities there would begin to probe any available leads, making arrangements to speak to those that had known Nani. This included the estranged father of her one and only child, whose relationship with the missing woman had been described as rocky at best. Now, let's pause for just a moment to hear a word from today's sponsors. Today's episode is also brought to you by BetterHelp. Is there something that interferes with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? If so, BetterHelp Online Counseling is here for you. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient, and you can now get help on your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text options with your therapist, who are specialized with any issues that you might be struggling with at the moment, such as depression stress, anxiety, LGBTQ matters, family conflicts, anything. BetterHelp is available worldwide and is available in four communication modes. Text, chat, phone, and video. All of your communications are secure, and if you are not happy with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time for no additional charge. Best of all, unresolved listeners get 10% off of their first month using the discount code UNRESOLVED. Go to betterhelp.com unresolved and fill out the introduction questionnaire to let BetterHelp assess your needs and match you up with a counselor that you will love. Once again, you could claim that offer by heading to betterhelp.com unresolved and make sure to use the unresolved discount code. Now, let's return to the show. 
In the weeks after the disappearance of Nani Dotson, investigators would begin to reach out to Nani's most recent ex, Edward Veal. After all, most violent crimes are committed by those close to the victim, and in this case, the father of Nani's daughter seemed to look like a good suspect for a number of reasons. Edward Veal was significantly older than Nani, having been upwards of 50 years old when they met a couple of years prior. At the time of her disappearance, he was 53 years old and lived in a northern suburb on the outskirts of San Antonio. As I mentioned earlier, the two had met in a country dancing class and became an item for a very short-lived period of time, during which time Nani became pregnant, much to Edward's chagrin. The pregnancy would cause their relationship to end prematurely, and it's been said that Edward became hostile towards Nani from this point forward, claiming that he wanted nothing to do with their child, and letting it be known that he was not prepared to become a father. In June of 2005, police had been called to Veal's home in Hollywood Park, Texas, after he called them to let them know that his ex was refusing to leave. When police arrived, they noted that the two were arguing, and an officer's report of the incident would later recount. Upon arrival, I contacted Veal, who stated that Nani was refusing to leave. After speaking with both subjects, it was determined that there had been no physical violence. Dotson had come to the residence to pick up some of her belongings, and the two subjects got into a verbal disturbance. Just a few days after this incident, Nani would give birth to her daughter, Savannah, and Edward continued to reiterate that he wanted to have no involvement in the child's life. In fact, it was reported by several outlets that Edward would end up contesting the paternity for months, making it an issue that worked its way through the court system, resulting in him having to take a DNA test, which came back positive. He was then ordered to pay for some of Savannah's medical expenses and back child support, as well as contribute at least $900 a month moving forward. It just so happens that this decision was handed down about two months prior to Nani's disappearance. Several of Nani's friends would begin to speak to reporters with the now-defunct website, The Crime Library, where they recounted things that they had learned about Edward through Nani. Speaking under the guise of anonymity, one of Nani's co-workers stated, Nani and I worked together at in the intensive care unit. She told me that she was having a very nasty custody battle over her daughter, Savannah, but that she had won the case and her ex wasn't taking advantage of the supervised visitation. I don't know any details, just that she was frightened of Savannah being alone with her ex. She didn't tell me why. Another acquaintance of Nani's, a neighbor that had moved in just a year or so prior, was quoted as saying in the same article, When we moved in and she met us, one of the first things she said to us was that she had problems with her ex, and that if we saw anything suspicious, to call the police, and that if anything ever happened to her, if she came out missing or was hurt or anything, that he, Veal, was behind it. After learning all of this information, it was evident why investigators wanted to speak to Edward Veal pretty badly, despite him living a thousand miles away from where Nani had disappeared from. At first, citing advice from his lawyer, Veal would decline to speak to investigators. Later, he agreed to meet with investigators and talk to them, but blew off their scheduled meeting, an occurrence that led investigators to suspect him all the more. However, a couple of weeks later, in early December 2006, Edward Veal would finally speak to detectives in a meeting that lasted less than an hour, and was apparently enough to prove that he had had nothing to do with Nani's disappearance. Afterward, Veal would not say much to reporters, but would tell some journalist with the Rocky Mountain News that, I completely cooperated with investigators. Veal's lawyer, Jay Norton, would be a bit more comprehensive in his responses to the press, telling reporters with the Denver Post that Veal had been in San Antonio and nearby Fredericksburg on the weekend of Nani's disappearance, and had not only witnessed corroborations to prove it, but receipts from purchases he had made over several days. Norton would also tell reporters that Veal had not spoken to Nani in about a year and a half, communicating with her through his lawyer during legal proceedings and allowed investigators to access his cell phone to prove it. Norton would tell reporters, He was pretty much across the board cooperative. We covered the relevant time frame that they asked us to cover, before the disappearance and some days after that. He expressed his sincere wish that they find her, and find her quickly and unharmed. 
In the weeks to come, authorities from Colorado's Jefferson County would make it clear that no information being sent to them from Texas was helpful in determining what had happened to Nani Dotson, indicating that neither Edward nor the others questioned by detectives in Texas had provided anything that indicated their involvement, as explained by Jefferson County Sheriff's spokeswoman Jackie Kelly, who stated that Veal was no longer a suspect or person of interest. I cannot give you any specifics, but I can say he answered all of the questions he was asked. Then, when asked about whether or not any of the information obtained was useful in their case, Kelly responded, We are still no closer to understanding what happened. One of the most prominent theories in this case, at least early on, was the possibility that 33-year-old Nani Dotson had decided to disappear on her own, leaving her infant daughter in the care of her older brother and his family, and then running off to start a new life free from any prior commitments or relationships. This theory seems to have gained a lot of traction early on, simply because there was no evidence of any foul play or wrongdoing on the part of anyone involved. However, as time would go on, weeks and then months, the likely likelihood of this seems to have slowly slipped away. Nani's disappearance was initially handled as a missing persons case, but responsibility for investigating it would be handed off to Jefferson County homicide investigator Kate Baton about one year later. At that time, Baton spoke to reporters with the Denver Post and stated, As time goes on, it's strange that if she was voluntarily missing, we have absolutely no evidence. None of her financial records have been accessed. It's odd that there have been no sightings. But that's really the thing with runaway theories when it comes to missing persons reports. Because there's no evidence, it seems to indicate that their disappearing act might have been well planned, especially if they were someone like Nani, a member of the military, who was intelligent and diligent, and seems to have generally had her life together in a way that many don't. However, this lack of evidence isn't really proof of anything. In fact, you could argue, it's the exact opposite. In the wake of the desertion of Marine Lance Herring, whose story I detailed in the episode introduction, it's now believed that authorities might have been unwilling to rule out Nani similarly going AWOL, at least much more than they usually would have considering that there was no evidence. However, from the jump, almost all of her friends and family members would push back against this theory, stating that there was no reason for Nani to have run away from her life. Not only was she in a career field that she enjoyed, nursing, she had a young daughter that she cared for and planned to raise on her own and had just recently been training to deploy overseas. So her going AWOL on her remaining military service would not make much sense, and would undoubtedly ruin any future plans that she might have, because a dishonorable discharge for going AWOL is just about as big of a red flag for future employers as possible. Besides, she only had a few months left remaining in her commitment to the military, so why would she decide to run away then? It really made no sense for Nani to have run away while visiting friends and family in Colorado thousand miles away from her home in Texas, where all of her belongings remained. After leaving her brother's home with nothing more than the clothing on her back and her purse, there have been no witness sightings of Nani in the years since, as well as no activity from her cell phone and no indication that she's used any of her bank or credit card accounts since. In short, nothing that indicates she intentionally ran away. One of the other more prominent theories to crop up in the weeks and months after Nani's disappearance was the possibility of her having fallen prey to an unknown killer. Perhaps someone that she had met through the dating sites that she had been using in the months prior to her going missing. Throughout 2006, Nani was active on a few dating sites, such as singleparentsmeet.com, where she actively corresponded with other single parents in an effort to find a potential love interest. And, like many of us active online in the mid-2000s, Nani also had a MySpace page, which she logged into and updated regularly. On the morning of her disappearance, November 19th, 2006, Nani had spent a few hours online, browsing several websites while staying with her brother and his family. She had logged into singleparentsmeet.com at least twice that day, once at 2.30 a.m. when she got back from a nearby dance club, and again at 1 p.m., just an hour or so before she left her brother Tony's house. Tony later stated that he believed her to have left to grab a smoothie from a nearby shopping center, but she did not drive his car, as she had done the night prior, and it was unknown if she had walked there 
or decided to get a ride from somebody else. It's been postulated by some that Nani might have arranged to meet with somebody in the local area, perhaps a potential love interest that she met online, or an old friend. And if so, they might have been the last known person to see her alive because she was already planning to move back to the area in approximately two or three months. It's believed that she was looking to start building a life for herself and her daughter in Colorado. It's unknown if investigators were ever able to find any connections between Nani and those in the local area, people that she might have met the night before or made plans to meet with on the day of her disappearance. But there has been no sign of any activity from her since that afternoon. Beyond that, she seems to have vanished into thin air. On November 24th, 2006, about a week after Nani's disappearance, it would be reported that her 16-month-old daughter Savannah had been taken to a hospital after falling ill and would be placed in the care of a doctor the following day, November 25th. Savannah would be watched over by Nani's brother Tony and his family in the weeks after her mother's disappearance, but was eventually transferred to the custody of her grandma, Candace Doyle, Nani's mother, who had since remarried and was living in California at the time. Candace would end up as Savannah's guardian for over a year, but in January of 2008, more than a year after Nani's disappearance, her daughter was sent to live with her father, Edward Veal, who, as far as I am aware, remains her legal guardian today. For many, Nani Nani's young daughter was proof enough that she had not run away, with her twin brother Bo Dotson later telling reporters, she adored her daughter, she meant everything to her, she would never leave her behind. Some people online believe that Edward Veal fighting for custody of his daughter after fighting her paternity for so long, and vocally wanting nothing to do with her for two years indicated an abrupt shift in behavior. Some of these online commenters believed that this might have been due to him wanting to get out of making his monthly child support payments, but others seemed to take a more altruistic path, believing that he wanted to be a good father for the little girl, who was now left without a mother. All hope for her sake that the latter was true. Over the next few years, the story of Nani Dotson would begin to slip from the minds of those in the region. There had been no sign of life from the missing woman since November of 2006, and she was listed as a missing person in not only Colorado State, but the US military, who had initially listed her as AWOL. More than five years would pass before the story would begin to surface in the media once again, after connections were made to another criminal case, which had a very unusual link to Nani's disappearance. In the early morning hours of May 21st, 2012, a young woman in West Denver was awoken by an unknown male who immediately began grabbing and striking her before placing a sheet over her head. It was just after 3 a.m. when the woman was attacked by this masked man in her own bed with him using a sheet to restrict her breathing while he bound her hands behind her back. With her now bound and blindfolded, the man would use a knife to begin cutting off her clothing. She would attempt to fight back briefly, breaking free from her restraints, but was thrown to the ground in response, having her head slammed onto the floor multiple times. Her hands were then rebound, and she was then raped on her own bed. Afterward, the masked man left almost immediately, presumably leaving through the front door downstairs, which was later found unlocked. Locked. It was believed that he had stolen the victim's cell phone, as she could not find it where she had left it just a few hours prior and had to drive to her boyfriend's house nearby to call 911. In the days to come, her cell phone would not be found, leading to the theory that this was a burglary gone wrong. Thankfully, the victim in this case survived, but she was understandably left shaken after this ordeal. She was unable to describe her attacker in any measurable way, since he had attacked her while she was sleeping, did not speak throughout the assault, and slipped out before she had a chance to look at him. As you can imagine, this was a terribly degrading and painful experience for the survivor to have gone through, and would leave investigators in the area on edge, fearing that they had a new violent criminal on the loose. However, as it turned out, the truth was much much closer to home than originally expected. 
As investigators began to look into the particulars of this violent break-in, they discovered a couple of clues that pointed to the rapist being a prior acquaintance of the victim. There was no sign of forced entry into the typically locked home, which indicated that the rapist knew another way in. And it was reported by the survivor that her dog did not respond at all to the intruder, indicating to investigators that the dog was familiar with whoever this was. A few days later, investigators would learn that one man who was familiar with the dog, having dog sat for the victim on at least one prior occasion, knew where her spare key was kept. In a surprising development, this man was the fiancé of the surviving victim's friend, who had seen her the night before this violent rape. Weeks after beginning their investigation, police began to narrow in on 39-year-old Tony Dotson, the brother of the still-missing Nani Dotson. Having divorced his former wife back in 2009, Tony was now engaged to another woman, who was good friends with the victim in this rape case from 2012. Not only had Tony made sexual comments towards his fiancé's friend in the past, but he had seen her just hours before this sexual assault, texting her in the hours after to figure out where she was, what she was doing, etc. Basically, a middle-aged version of, you up? Investigators were told by friends that Tony knew where the victim's spare key was hidden, and had dog sat for her in the past, and they began to suspect that he had staged a burglary in order to specifically target and rape this young woman. When questioned, Tony denied any involvement in the crime and seemed to cast the victim aside as a crazy woman who made up stories and exaggerated past incidents to downplay her own faults. But police seemed to see through this facade, which was verified when DNA tests from the crime scene came back as a positive match for Tony Dodson. In total, he would be charged with first-degree burglary, second-degree assault, and sexual assault with a deadly weapon, being convicted for these crimes in 2014 and sentenced to 96 years to life in prison. However, in the lead-up to his trial and sentencing, an even more odd story regarding Tony Dotson began to unfold from behind the walls of the jail that he was being held in. It was being alleged that he had attempted to solicit the murder of the victim in this rape case while awaiting trial. According to Denver District Attorney Mitch Morrissey, he was soliciting individuals in the jail that had gang connections. In December of 2013, officials at the jail would learn that Tony Dotson had offered members of the Eight Trace Gangster Crips, the Gallant Knights Insane, and the 211 crew more than $20,000 in cash, as well as a ring valued at $14,000 and a Mercedes-Benz, to kill the surviving victim from his case, who was residing in Denver at the time but would later move out of the region for her own safety. Prior to extending this offer, he had a friend on the outside sent nearly $7,000 to his inmate account, and he would use this money to curry favor with other inmates in an attempt to butter them up, buying them food and snacks and things like that, before eventually offering them more money to kill the woman from his sexual assault. Two gang members were later arrested and charged with arranging the hit, but for weeks and months after this, Tony would continue attempting to solicit murder. Eventually, Tony Dodson was charged with criminal solicitation to commit murder, and was later given a maximum sentence of 48 years in prison, which he would serve consecutively to his already lengthy 96-year sentence. After his arrest and multiple convictions in the mid-2010s, Tony would become an obvious person of interest in his sister's still-unsolved disappearance, especially since, according to his own statements, he had been the last person to see her alive on the day that she disappeared, November 19th, 2006. In the aftermath, he had become one of the most outspoken advocates for her case, arranging for hundreds if not thousands of flyers to be put up in the surrounding area and speaking to the press during several attempts at public outreach. Some news articles I have found make mention of a death from 2009, which was a female business partner of Tony Dodson's who was found dead in her vehicle. Tony apparently inherited $300,000 from this woman's life insurance policy, and while he was never indicted in that case, police reportedly suspected his involvement. I have not been able to find out much more about this case, but this seems to indicate a more widespread pattern of criminal activity, which may or may not be limited to his rape case and his subsequent attempts to solicit the victim's death. With all of that being said, I don't know why Tony would want to kill his own sister, and I would hope that investigators thoroughly investigated his statements to them and the press, thoroughly vetting his alibis from the weekend in question, since his known and proven crimes include violent sexual assault, burglary, and solicitation of murder. I cannot put anything past him. 
but I find it hard to believe that he would commit a crime like this unless there was something in it for him. But maybe I am wrong. When questioned about Tony Dotson in the years after his conviction, investigators from Jefferson County would only state that he had been on a list of persons of interest with other friends and family members. Those that had a personal connection to Nani Dotson, who were all in the area at the time, and were suspected of potential involvement for one reason or another. At the time that they were asked, back in 2015, authorities Authorities from Jefferson County would state that nobody had been cleared from that list, including Tony Dodson. According to investigators at the time, everyone remained a suspect. Nani Ann Dotson was 33 years old when she went missing in November of 2006. At the time, she stood about 5 feet 3 inches tall, weighed around 115 pounds, had brown hair and brown eyes, and had a couple of noticeable scars, including one on her left knee from a car accident, a large scar on her right shoulder, which ran from the top to under her armpit, and had several scars on her feet from bunion surgery. If she is still alive 14 years later, she would now be 40. In the decade and a half since her disappearance from the Denver metropolitan area, there has been no sign of activity from her lifeless bank accounts, nor from her credit cards or cell phone, which died just days after her disappearance and has not been turned on again. Nani's family just want to put her to rest more than a decade later, having long ago accepted the reality that she is most likely dead. Nani's mother, Candace Doyle, would tell reporters with the Denver Post back in 2007, she's probably rotting in the ground or down someone's well. She deserves better. She served our country. She has saved people's lives. We want to give her a Christian burial. Years later, in 2017, Candace would tell Channel 9 News, There is no justice for Nani. Nani is gone now. I can't bring her back. I don't even care that the person who did this gets caught or punished. I don't even care anymore. All I want to do is bury my daughter. I know there's something left of her. If you know anything about this case or believe that you might know something, please contact the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office at 303-277-0211. Until such a time, the story of Nani Dotson will remain unresolved. Thank you for listening to this episode of Unresolved. I have been your host, Michael Whelan. This episode of the show was researched, written, and produced by myself, and the music throughout this episode was put together by yours truly through Amber Music. The song you're hearing right now, however, the Unresolved theme song, was written and composed by Ailsa Traves. For a full list of sources and references, as well as a transcript of each episode, please head to the podcast website at unresolved.me to learn more. Now, I would like to take a moment to thank the producers of this episode, who support the show each month through Patreon. Roberta Jansen, Ben Crocom, Gabriella Bromley, Peggy Bellarda, Quill Carter, Laura Hannon, Damian Moore, Brittany Norris, Amy Hampton, Stephen Wilson, Scott Meesey, Travis Sepko, Marie Vankland, Scott Patzold, Astrid Nyer, Aimee McGregor, Brian Hall, Sydney Scotton, Sarah Moscaritolo, Sue Kirk, Thomas Ahern, Joe Wong, Seth Morgan, Marion Welsh, Patrick Loxo, Alyssa Lawton, Kevin McCracken, Meadow Landry, Tatum Bautista, Tunya Elzinka, Michelle Watson, Ryan Green, Stephanie Joyner, Don Keller, Gravity Head Zero, Alyssa Hampton Dutro, Ruth Durbin, and Sally Ranford. Thank you all so, so much. It looks like I will be taking next week off, during which time I'll try and catch up on the Patreon stuff that I've been neglecting since my cross-country move. I should also have a nice little surprise, which I hope to be sharing with you in just a couple of days after this episode gets uploaded. But I should be back with another new episode the week after that, the weekend of the 21st. Until then, I hope you all stay safe and stay healthy. I'll talk to you later.